Derek. Hey, Jason. How are you? Man, good, good. Dr. Steve McVeigh just had a brilliant <laughs> conversation, mind blowing, uh, try and keep up conversation with uh, the author of the new book, Quantum Life. I'm telling you, man, this was absolutely <laughs> epic. I, yeah. I cannot wait for people to hear this podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Dr. Steve McVeigh is just. He's resonating at a whole nother level. And, uh, you know, it's an inside joke. You got to listen to the podcast, yeah. to get the, <laughs> yes. the resonating piece. But uh, we, we dove into uh, quantum physics and, and he is able to break that down in a way that applies to our faith, to our theology, to our understanding of the creator and our, our and his creation. Uh, and, and he called himself a practical theologian and we got there uh, near the end of this too you know the understanding of of the supernatural life that Jesus lived and the life we've been invited into and the fact that science is more and more supporting uh, uh, a created universe a creator and a created universe I'm sorry I'm excited I'm this was a fun conversation I, I I'm still like reveling in what we just participated in and i just want to whet yeah. people's appetite when he gets to the discussion of a unique melody and a song yeah that is literally yeah. mapped to your own individual dna <laughs> i mean it's pretty crazy it doesn't I get any more god oriented yeah in that way that God has sung over you and deposited a song within you. But I think for me, the biggest issue is um, that ultimately we are all reconciled in Christ. And, uh, and we're, wow. we're going to go there for sure in this episode. Yeah. So yeah. hold on folks. Yes. This, is, yes. this is a good one. We get in. Yeah, you asked a good question around the universal nature of the love of God that took us down a beautiful road. And yeah, yeah. this is a, a good podcast and, uh, we'll have to do it again. Um, but yeah, like you said, hang on for the ride. <laughs> Enjoy it. Enjoy it. Looks good. It's um, it's good to have you, Steve. It's good to have you back. Uh, it was the early days of rethinking God with tacos when we first talked, and I I can't tell you how excited I was then and how thrilled I was to have you back on, especially in light of this new book. Um, you know, Derek and I talk about uh, union, intimacy, uh, the love of our Father, and grace. Uh, it's it's even when we're not recording. Uh, and I am fascinated. I am fascinated by the measureless nature of the love of God. And, and I'm fascinated by quantum physics. Uh, I'm not smart enough to grasp it fully, but, but I am fascinated by how it fits in, uh, in our personal lives and our faith walk. And so I'm thrilled you're here. Uh, basically, I know you can jump on anything, but I'm thrilled you're here, excited to talk about this new book. And, but share a little bit, uh, Steve, share a little bit about, and I know you're Dr. Steve as well, if you want me to call you that. Uh. Uh, I, I, be, I became Dr. Steve when I was a pastor of sick churches and thought they needed help. So uh, <laughs> now that I'm not a local pastor anymore, I, I seldom have to use that title. <laughs> but hey, it's good to be back with you guys again. I enjoyed yeah. last time. It's been quite a while, hasn't it? But uh, it has, yeah. I really enjoyed yeah. being with you then. And uh, yeah. This is it. Uh, this is the book that you're there it is. talking about. Quantum it's, Life by Dr. Quantum Steve Life. McVeigh. Today yeah. is uh, one month, one month ago that this was released, and uh, I'm very pleased with it. Uh, I don't know. You know, we've talked about my past in the past, but I'll just I'll do the elevator summary. And then if there's something you want me to zero in on, you can let me know. And I'm happy to talk about anything you want for as long as you want. But uh the short of it is that uh, I, I became a senior pastor at 19 years old, so that was uh, come, that, that was just about 50 years ago now. It's 69 in July, so it's about. Would you recommend that 19 year old senior yeah. pastor? Are you kidding? Wow! Can you believe that that one of the men who were who was a leader in that church at that time, who was about my parents' age at the time, is still alive? And I talked to him recently. He's like 100 or 101. I think he hit 100 this year. And I said, Harvey, what in the world were you guys thinking calling a 19-year-old boy to be your pastor? 
but they did. And uh, wow, it was a wonderful, a wonderful introduction to pastoral ministry for me. It was a great group of people that were patient and loving toward me. So, yeah, I was a senior pastor at 19 years old, and uh, I served in a, as a pastor of local churches until I was 40 years old. And in 1990, uh, and again, I'm compressing a lot into a little, but in 1990, uh, I I came to a breaking point in my life and in my ministry. I fully discussed it in my first book called Grace Walk that is still in print. It was published in 95, but it's still in print and has done well over the years. But I discussed my journey there. Uh, In 1990, when I came to that breaking place, I had been uh, uh, in the pastoral ministry for many years. And I uh, wrote about how that I was I was going to say ready to give up, but actually I did give up. I, I, I prayed on October 6, 1990 and told God, uh, I quit. I, I'm, I'm done with ministry. I went on to say, now, it, it, if you really truly have a ministry here through me or with me that you want to do, I'm open, but I'm tired of trying to make the wheels of the bus go round and round. And I said, for that matter, uh, I'm done with trying to live the Christian life because It's great for getting you into heaven, but in the meantime, it's not all it's cracked up to be. So I'm done with that part of it, too. And it was a turning point in my life. I came to a place uh, that I call absolute surrender. And it was October 6, 1990. Again, I wrote about it in my first book, and people can read that if they've not read it, how that it became a pivotal moment. Uh, There was an epiphany, a burst of revelation that came to me that night. And having been a believer since I was eight years old, and at the time I was, I guess, 36, uh, I began to get a glimpse of grace in a way that I'd never understood it before. Right. Right. And that was the starting point for everything. Now, years would continue to pass and ho- and I would continue to grow, as hopefully we all do. My theology would only deepen. My understanding of God would only grow stronger. And my belief about the love of God would only become more far reaching as the years went by. But 1990 was the starting point for me. I wrote my first book, Grace Walk, in 94. It came out in 95, and uh, I left the local pastorate in 1994 after 20 years of being a local pastor. I started an organization called Grace Walk Ministries. My first book is called Grace Walk, yeah. and I've led that ministry ever since. We have offices on, in six uh, countries, and I've, I've been on all the continents of the world except Antarctica. We've do, it's just been incredible. I've just I've just felt like I've been strapped to a rocket hanging on to wait to see where God's going to take us next. And here I am now, an old man. And I, I would say the first monumental shift, you know, was back then in 1990. And then years later, probably 2005, uh, I got a hold of Baxter Kruger's little book, The Great Dance. And uh, yeah, he talked yeah. to Baxter. And I said, wait a minute, this guy's teaching what I'm teaching our identity in Christ. But then the more closely I looked, I said, wait a minute. He's not just teaching the believer's identity in Christ. He's teaching the efficacy of the cross for all humanity. Yeah. I, yeah. Through Coming in through Baxter's writing, I came into Jürgen Moltmann and Karl Barth and others that would wow. uh, have had a lot to say about the theology of inclusion or the theology of affection or the theology of hope, just depending on who you read. Sure. And again, I had a theological shift and, Yep. I would go on to write about that in uh, one of my books called uh, Beyond an Angry God. And yep. the next step was this quantum step. And we can talk about any or, any or all of this. And that was when, after I began to teach the inclusive nature of God and his, 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 uh, the, 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 the application of the finished work of the cross for all of humanity, and I got such pushback from the evangelical world on it, Sure. I finally came to the place where I thought, I can't believe that Christian people get pissed off by good news. But <laughs> they, don't want to hear, they don't want to hear this. No. no. And so I just, yeah, I just began to read and study, and it was by divine providence, just the sp- leadership of the Spirit, that I came across some books by, about quantum mechanics. And I right. started reading those books just for fun. My wife would roll her eyes and say, who thinks it's fun to read about? (laughs) But as you guys know, because you've read some on it, and I'll say to everybody watching or listening, it's an ocean of information, but you don't have to swim in the deep end. You can start in the shallow end, and there's a lot to be gleaned even on the shallow end of the pool 
of quantum mechanics. And as I began to study that at first, I was I began to see a similarity between what the quantum physicists were saying about ultimate reality, the nature of reality, and what the Bible says. And the more I studied, I began to see it come together almost like a Venn diagram where there were the right. two circles overlapped and there was this center section. And I said, wow, that's that's actually saying what the Bible says. And as I could, kept studying, finally the two circles coincided and I came to the place where I am now, which is to say that in many instances, quantum mechanics is telling us the same thing that the Bible has always told us, but it's telling it to us in a different language, in the language right. of science. And that's wow. exhilarating to me for a lot of reasons. Not that our faith needs to be validated, but we all grew up in a world of, in this corner, you have Jesus Christ weighing in at 180 pounds. And in this corner, you have Charles <laughs> Darwin weighing in at 180 pounds, you know, and bang, <laughs> on the bell rings and off they go to the fight. Well, quantum mechanics is not like that. Yeah, quantum science yeah. is compatible and, and even complementary to our faith. And so now I say that it's the same thing. And I've, I've written about it and I'm teaching about it. And uh, and I find it's opening doors for me to share the truth of a spiritual truth with people that wouldn't be open if I spoke the language of scripture, but they're open if I talk quantum language. So it's an exciting yeah. journey. Hey, Man, uh, I, hey, Steve, listen, um, before we jump into quantum uh, theory and mechanics and, and that, which I'm very excited to get into, I, I just, as a pastor, I can't imagine a 19 year old kid <laughs> and in your in your position, I, I'm like I, I shouldn't even had car keys at age 19. Um, so wow, that's that's amazing. Also, uh, thank you for bringing us into the boxing ring of you know Jesus versus uh, the enemy. There, that reminds me of a Carmen video from way back. But um, I want to ask you about that encounter, that first encounter in 1990, when you said you like grace became real to you. Can you just elaborate on that a little more? What was it about grace? What was the impartation, revelation, whatever you want to call it? What happened in that moment to shift your thinking about God? Well, you guys are all about rethinking God, right? Yeah. So there, there have been two profound, I mean, cataclysmic uh, shifts in my life in regard yeah. to how I see God. The yeah. first one was in 1990. And I'll talk about that. I had been reared in a good Christian home. My parents were both wonderful Christian people. My dad was a deacon. My mother was a Sunday school teacher. But I grew up in a main, mainline evangelical home where we had a certain perception of who God is and the gist of it was, and still is in the evangelical world, that God is a good God. He's sure. loving, but he's also a just God. And in the version of God that we grew up with, we were told that because he is just, the most important thing for you to understand from the get-go is that you're a sinner. Right. And God can't abide that. But because he's good, he's made a way for you to avoid his judgment because his justice demands that he pay you back for what you've done. And the payback, if you don't accept this remedy, is eternity in hell. But because of his goodness, he came into the world in the incarnation through Jesus. And on the cross, the son took the brutal punishment of the father so that you and I wouldn't have to take that. And now all we need to do in order for it to be applicable to us is to believe it and call upon Christ and ask him to forgive us our sins and save us. And if we'll do that, now we'll go to heaven because now we've asked Jesus into our life. That was the version of the gospel. Yeah. Now the version of the Christian life was, so now that you're a Christian, you want to get started right, don't you? Well, if you want to get started right, you need to go to church you need to read your Bible, you need to pray, you need to evangelize and an ongoing list of things yeah. that we need to do to demonstrate that we really are a Christian. The list depends on the sectarian group that you belong to, the denomination you come from, but everybody has right. a list. So That's in 1990, right. after having been a successful pastor for a lot of years, 
I'd come to a church in Atlanta, Georgia, where I didn't feel like I was a success. The church had been declining before I got there, but that didn't scare me because everywhere I had gone to as a pastor, we would turn that baby around and things would start growing and the things would start happening and the ministry would become successful in terms of tangible metrics, sure. Think, sure. you know, attendance, baptisms, offering, staff, things right. like that. Yeah. It didn't happen in Atlanta. In fact, the church continued to die right out from under me. So on October 6, 1990, that's the night I was lying on my face that I'm describing that night of brokenness. And when I said to God, I give up, I swear <laughs> it was like I heard a voice inside me say, good. <laughs> finally, finally. Right. And again, to compress a lot of understanding and experience that took place in a night, I came to realize that I, that what I'd been taught was not true. I'd been told we're saved to serve. No, right. God doesn't need a maid. God lo was looking for a bride, not a maid. Yeah. Some churches, yeah. they're told we're saved to worship. What kind of narcissistic God is this? It needs us to <laughs> brag on him all the time. Right, right. I, I mean, I we were told a lot of things about who God is. But on that night in 1990, my paradigm, it was a Damascus Road experience for me. Now, let me be quick to say that it doesn't happen that way for everybody. Sure. My wife sure. is an example. The light gradually began to be brighter and brighter for her until the, it reached saturation point and she saw the truth and grace and who she is in Christ. But for me, it was a Damascus Road experience. Yeah, I, laid, yeah. I, I, I was lying on the floor crying and railing at God, literally shaking my fist lying on my stomach said, what do you want from me? I've given my whole life to you since I was a boy. What do you want from me? And again, I'm telling you inside my mind, not audibly louder than that in my mind, I heard God say, I want you. Right. <laughs> I just want you. Wow. And that was yeah. a turning point for me. So what shifted, what, what really shifted Derek was I began to realize that God didn't want me because of anything that I could do for him. But here's the beauty of it. He wanted me just because he loves me. Yeah. 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 Wow. I love, love that verse where Jesus said, this is eternal life. Yeah. Says, Father, this is eternal life that they may know you and the one whom you have sent. And that word know doesn't mean like the three of us know each other. That yeah. word know used there is the same word that's used when it says that Mary did not know a man until after the birth of Jesus. It's a word yeah. of intimacy. Yes. Yeah. I realized that there's nothing I have God needs. This world was doing quite fine before 1954 when Steve McVeigh showed up here. <laughs> and when I punch out and step across and leave my shift in this world, nothing, they, they won't, nobody, nothing's going to miss a beat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because Man. God's still been, God still got his plan in motion. And it was, what a great relief. It's a rest. Finally, it makes yeah. sense what yeah. Jesus said. Yeah. Come to yeah. me yeah. who labor and heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Rest? I thought rest was a sin. I didn't know it was a gift. <laughs> <laughs> I and love it. They offered decades. Remember, I was a 19-year-old pastor in the beginning. And I mean, you know, youth, God bless all of us yeah. for being young and those that are, because you're ready to, I was ready to charge hell with a squirt gun when I was a young man. Evangelism <laughs> was my thing. One day, listen to this. One day I knocked on 105 doors going door to door every day. I defy you to find a Jehovah's Witness or Mormon who can talk that way. <laughs> I used to say I'd rather burn it. out than rust out. And then one day the Lord said to me, either way, you're out. Oh, my wow. gosh. And you did burn out. You did burn I out. Did. And so this whole wow. thing of resting in Christ and understanding that God just wants us to, to love us to, to, so that we can be containers and, con, and, and conduits of that love. That's what it's all about. Man. It's everything. Uh, I am. Um, I talk about it. I've talked about it often here, so I won't. Uh, but briefly, I, you know, I had a cataclysmic moment shift in my life, and it was moving from the language that I would have used at the time was, you know, growing up in the charismatic church. The high water mark of spiritual maturity was how desperate I was for God, <laughs> and and um, 
boy, the day that I came into a revelation of father and the fact that he's not, that, that, that what kind of father would want my desperation, that there is no desperation, no insecurity. And, and it's a, it's a beautiful story, but the short of it was, it was, it was like that again, like what you said, it was cataclysmic. It was that road. It was a, it was a, a incredible immediate shift that then played out in my in my understanding for the coming years but i love that there's room for a saturated approach as well because isn't that the journey we're on there's this grace to be able to navigate at the pace uh that that uh we're at and that he walks beside us like uh, that stranger on the emmaus road for me the catalyst though and this is where I, i'm going to shift this because i i, I really got to dive into this 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 book because for me, the catalyst was two things. God is is uh, is is love, or as Bill Johnson said, uh, he's he's good and he's in a good mood. This idea that God was in a good mood, um, I can't tell you how transformative that was, and that God was love, and that His love is always good. This idea that God is good, that He can be trusted, was was a shift, and that God is like Jesus. Jesus is what God looks like. Uh, and he's in a good mood and he can be trusted. He's always good. Those, those things were being poured into me were, were foundational pieces that allowed for me to, to lean into some places that would have been, uh, maybe scary or even some might've said heretical. They would have, they would have, um, challenged me on, you know, I, I had a season where I only read the new Testament or I, or excuse me, I only read the gospels. I, I had this moment where I realized, wait, God is like Jesus. Like this isn't rocket science, but how come, how come I, same as you grew up in the church. How come this is rocket science that God is like Jesus. I had to get rid of everything. Just read the gospels because I had to reset my lens of who God was like. God was like Jesus. I had that cataclysmic moment. And then the, the, the conversation shifted to this idea here. Um, I use this language. It was basically I'd been living towards something. I've been living for something. And in that moment, I shifted everything, became this reality of living from. And so then it was a revelation of, and in the last 15 years, a revelation of union, of oneness, of intimacy, of quantum physics. And I would love, or I would love for you to, I heard you speak on this. I, I've got the book. I've only read just a little bit. I just got it yesterday. Um, but um, you talked about how the two, how science and faith seem to be at, at odds for each other for so long. And in recent years, we're coming to this place of understanding uh, that they support each other. And you, you mentioned that the universe is a friendly place was something Einstein said, and it grabbed my ear. The idea that science is coming to the conclusion that God is good uh, is a fascinating thought for me and that quantum physics supports that. So walk us through the beginning place of where you see quantum physics beginning to support this love that transcends dimensions of time and space. And I'll stop talking now, man. Let me say for those who want to know my theological perspective, I wrote a book called beyond an angry God. I've written 18 books. Number 17 book. is called beyond an angry God. Number 18 is this quantum life book, but in beyond an angry God, I describe I write what I might call theology proper. It is, it is a theological unpacking of the truth of who God is. Now, with quantum life in this book, I'm going to call this uh, practical theology, applied theology. Here's who we are in Christ. Now, how do we live the life? Yeah. yeah. So if, if my book, Beyond an Angry God, might be compared to a presentation of the gospel. Like, let's say it's the gospel according to Steve, although Steve didn't originate it, but you get my point. Yeah. Quantum life, I would say, is an epistle because it's going to tell people how to apply the truth of the gospel in their lives in practical ways using scientific terminology. I use a lot, I cite a lot of scientific experiments. I quote a lot of scientists. Now, here's the thing. Let's go back to what you were talking about, Jason, with science in the old days. It's important that people understand that when we think about science and we're talking about, you know, Newtonian science, Isaac Newton, who, by the way, was a devoted follower of Jesus Christ. However, like all of us, he lived in the time period in which he lived and he only knew what he knew. 
But we talk about Newtonian science or Darwinian science, that scientific materialism that all of us grew up being taught. It's important to understand that when we push back against aspects of that, we're not pushing back against some sacred ancient tradition because until the 17th century, um, there was no discipline known as science. You and I talk for around the word science. Well, science shows us, follow the science. We believe the science. Well, you know what they called science before Francis Bacon came along and some of those guys, they called it natural philosophy. Or if they were Christian people, they called it theology. It was the study of the creation and how the creator works in his creation. So I want to say this science that so many people worship, scientific materialism, which by the way, don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it's all wrong. It's not, not at all. But that kind of science, it's not like it's gospel. It's only been around 300 years. The word science, the Latin word has always been around, but it simply meant knowledge. But about 100 years ago, actually around a little more than that now, around 1903, 1904, 1905, in those early years, um, a group of scientists began to come to the forefront and present an understanding of reality based on empirical evidence that in many ways violated what scientists had always believed. This nascent science, which you and I now know as quantum science, turned the world upside down among those who have understood it and believed it, including scientists. It was Albert Einstein who early on said about quantum science, if this is true, it's going to destroy science. It's kind of comical because what Einstein was saying is, if what you guys are saying is true, it's going to destroy my kind of science. He reminds me a lot of the church fundamentalists that I've known through the years who push back against grace because they say, well, if that's true, then everything I believed is wrong. (laughs) <laughs> As time right. would pass, Albert Einstein would become a reluctant convert because to his credit, unlike a lot of churchmen, Einstein had an open mind that if the evidence was there, he was willing to change his mind or as we would say in the church world, well, repent. And he did. He debated back and forth with Niels Bohr and some of the other early quantum pioneers for a long time. But little by little, Einstein did change his mind about a lot of things. But in the beginning of the 20th century, Neil, well, Max Planck is, is the one that many would call the father of quantum mechanics. Max Planck is the one that coined the phrase the matrix. And, you know, the movie that was taken from his idea about the matrix. So the matrix, six centuries before Jesus was born, people were talking about it. The early Greeks called it the ether and they considered it the heir of the gods. Come on forward in modern times now, contemporary times you'll hear people saying this. They'll talk about the matrix or like the 6th century BC Greeks, the ether. You'll hear people talk about the field, the unified field. A lot of people will say the universe. But when you listen to what they say about the universe, you know they're not talking about just stars and planets. They're talking about ultimate reality. They're talking about God. They just don't want to say the word or, or don't know to say the word. When we talk about that field, Oh, by the way, Jesus called it the kingdom of God. Yes. Paul the apostle called it in Christ. So when we talk about this unified field, what quantum science is coming along and telling us for the last hundred years or so is, listen to this, I love it. There is this all pervasive atmosphere. I'm going to speak science and let those who have spiritual ears hear. There's this all pervasive atmosphere It is, to quote one physicist, an energy of the more subtle kind, but it is from within that energy that everything which is material came to be. And it is by that energy that everything is sustained. Now, that's science talking. Well, I don't think you have to have a master divinity degree to recognize we're talking about Christ there. Yeah, the that sounds familiar. All things have been created. The one who sustains by him, all things hold together. The apostle Paul yeah. said, yeah. So the, so the exciting thing is <clears throat> that the matrix, 
the field that encompasses everything, that gave rise to everything, that holds everything together. It's not just a, 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 a an impersonal force, kind of like the four forces of nature, electromagnetism, gravity, strong nuclear force, weak nuclear force. No, 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 no. This field is not just a force of nature. This field is a person named Christ. And it is in him. Now back that everything exists. Now back to Einstein's question. He's reputed to have asked, is the, he said, in fact, it's the most important answer that anybody could give to a question. Is the universe a friendly place? Well, in, in his own way, what he was saying was, was John telling the truth? Is God love? Now, Einstein would go on to conclude that based on symmetry and balance and the beauty of nature and, and, and all of the, the intricacies of nature, that yes, the universe is a friendly place, or as we would say, God is love. So this quantum science, let me, let me make sure I put this on the table right out in front. The most important message we learn from quantum mechanics is that everything is connected. There is old school scientific materialism saw everything as freestanding. The universe was understood to be like a giant machine where you've got, you've got levers over here, pistons going up and down, belts that are turning, gears that are spinning, and everything is cause and effect. This causes that, causes that, causes that, causes that. And it, it affected us in the scientific world by leading to an understanding of, a, <clears throat> of an evolution <clears throat> that starts with a, primor a primordial soup. And there's this upward causation. You've got this primordial soup and it evolves into this and then this and then this, and it moves upward. Quantum science says, no, things come into being by focused intention and elevated desire. And science is so much on this. Now we're talking about the Christ who had a focused intention to create and had a desire to make man in his own image. Science has become so strong on this. There's a guy, he's my favorite quantum physicist. He's not a Christian man. In fact, he's a practicing Hindu. His name is Amit Goswami. He's a retired professor at the University of Oregon. He's a quantum physicist. The man said in his own words, with all that I knew of science, it didn't bring me in. And I'm paraphrasing, but you can get his book and I'll give the name of it. He said, it didn't give me any help on how to be a better husband. It didn't teach me anything about how to be a better dad. He said, but in the quantum realm, I began to understand some things that transform my perspective. And this man who at one time, I assume, was an atheist as a scientific materialist, has written a book. He's Hindu, so don't go there thinking you're going to get a Christian presentation. He's a deist, not a theist, a deist. But yeah. He wrote a book called God is not dead hmm. and he wrote it so that the scientific community would have empirical evidence from the world of science that there is a God. And as I said, Darwinian evolution teaches upward causation. Amika Swami said, no, things exist because of downward causation. There's an ultimate source above us that intended that there be created things and that focused and brought it through his intention and desire, brought those things into being. And even Albert Einstein said that if you look at it, he said the universe seems to be dancing to an in, to the tune of an invisible piper. So if can I say it this way? And I'm exaggerating. Don't take me too seriously or too literally. But can I say it like this? Science has got saved. <laughs> <laughs> so I love it. The Staldo, Staldo I, uh, trail. And when people push back now, listen, you can argue with my theology, but you want to argue with science? Well, you can be an idiot if you want to. That's what I think about it when people want to argue. Because unlike folks at church, you know, a guy can eat a pizza and go to bed and have a dream and wake up and suddenly he's had a revelation from God during the night. And people will be like, oh, yeah, yeah, he had a he got the glory. He got a revelation. Nothing to, nothing to verify or substantiate the reality of it. Science doesn't work that way. These guys, it has to be proven to them again and again and again. And through empirical evidence, these guys are now saying, yeah, there is an intelligent ultimate reality. And it is from that source that all things exist. And it's just exciting to see. Guys, my book is out, Leaving and Finding Jesus. If you've already read it, I would be so grateful if you would go to Amazon and write a review. 
This actually helps the rankings. It also helps people trust the book before they buy it. Uh, thankful for you for that. And also so thankful for all the support that's come in over the last little bit. We're just, we're just blown away, blessed by folks' generosity. You know, A Family Story is a nonprofit. This is a listener-supported podcast. And uh, we're just so grateful to be on the journey with you. Guys, I'm so thankful for you. Praying life, and joy, and wonder over you today. All right, let's get back to the podcast. What gets me excited, um, and why why I'm 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 not smart enough to, and I I say that self demeaning. I I think I can pick up on some things, but but I know what love is, and over the years I have grown in in, in my confidence. Uh, I, in fact, I, I I often feel like I'm the most confident person in the room simply because I know that I'm loved. And I know that there's the, the, the nature of love surpasses time and space, that it transcends dimensions of it's, it's, I'm here with you guys right now, but I'm also seated in heavenly places cheering us on as we have this conversation. The nature of love to me is, is, is this quantum. So when you start to put these words around it, I get excited because I grew up in the charismatic church uh, and and I'll use the language that I've used for so long trying to get to somewhere and and for me one of the high water marks one of the evidences that uh that that I was living um uh, I even a practical faith was that, uh, that I would experience the supernatural or that there would be miracles and, and then you want to understand how that happens. And of course, if you're living in the context of separation or you're living outside of grace or you think grace is this balancing act, uh, the thing that you're talking about, that striving you have to get to something, then you're constantly behind the eight ball. And when Jesus would say something like, um, you know, this, this only happens through prayer and fasting, or if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to there, nothing will be impossible for you. You're just at a loss. You're, tr- you're constantly trying to measure faith, trying to play this game of measurements. And so for the big, the big thing that happened for me is, is when I came into the revelation of his love and you step into grace and you start to live from this union, this place of oneness uh, that Jesus prayed for, uh, I, I began to, to think, uh, Oh, that when when Jesus was talking about faith the size of a mustard seed, he wasn't describing a measurement. He was describing the nature of his intimacy, the nature of his union, the awareness he had of God in him. And and so so suddenly you come along and you start to explain with 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 science uh, these miracles. You know, you call uh, quantum teleportation, quantum resonance. Like I, like, and I get so excited because for so long I've been living in a, in the tension of greater work shall you do, and the reality of of this moment I'm in. I, I would love for you to share because I love how you explain supernatural, the definition of supernatural. I, I love it. The supernatural. We've taken the Holy Ghost magic out of it. We're now able to see how Jesus lived his life. First of all, let's go back to Augustine. Augustine said miracles are not contrary to nature, but only contrary to what we know about nature. The thing we know now is that Jesus lived a quantum life. And for instance, when he appeared through behind in a room where the door was locked and he suddenly he appeared, that's quantum tunneling. When he spoke to the fig tree and, and the thing withered and died, that's quantum resonance. When he, uh, when he appeared over here in front of 500 from out of nowhere, that's called teleportation. Uh, over and over and over again, they're think And so the disciples looked at him doing this stuff. And one time, the, I love this, the disciples said to him, well, what do we need to do so that we can do the works of God? And Jesus said two things. One time he said to them, well, if you want to do the work of God that you need to do is believe on me. Now, there you go. There's your starting point for all miracles right. of Christ. Yeah. Then another time, I love what he said to them. He said, there are many things that I could tell you, but you wouldn't be able to bear it. I love the way the new Aramaic English version of that verse translates it. It says, Jesus said to them, there are many things that I could tell you, but you would not be able to grasp it. Right. They said, how did you do those miracles? He said, I could tell you, but you wouldn't be able to grasp it. All right. Then he goes on to say, 
but I'm going to leave. And after my departure, a teacher is going to come, the paraclete, the one who comes along the side, and that teacher will teacher will guide you into, listen to the next word, all truth. Wow. Not just biblical truth, all truth. Augustine yeah. said, anywhere you find truth, you find you find something that came from God. So all truth. So now the Holy Spirit has come along, and here we are as the people of God, two millennia later, after Jesus said that to his disciples. And look what's going on. The Holy Spirit <clears throat> is leading us into this truth so that now we look at the life of Jesus and we go, ah, I see what you did there. That's how you did that. One, but see, in the religious world, we want to make it so religious. Jesus came to these, he's talking to a guy and he says to him, <clears throat> he says to him, if you believe it'll happen. Now the charismatic say, oh, glory, we got to get, so we got to soak and sit and, and, and be sanctified. We got to, you know, ramp up our faith and, and believe hard enough. Jesus wasn't trying to give some doggone religious formula. He was stating a simple statement of fact. The way you think it's going to be is the way it's going to be. There right. are quips in the quantum world that pop. They call it popping quips. Innumerable outcomes. In the quantum world, it's called the Copenhagen interpretation, where every outcome already exists outside of space and time. The way the Bible would say it is, with God, all things are possible, or everything is possible to the one that believes. And then the scripture talks about the importance of setting your mind on the outcome you want. We it, That's faith. Science would call it focused intention. Now, don't get me wrong. This again, I jokingly say this is not Holy Ghost magic. This is not some sort of way that you control the eternal world, because let's be clear. The thing about the quantum world is that it's a world of probabilities. It's not mm -hmm. a world of absolute control. There's one thing called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle where you can't know the location and the speed of a particle at the same time. There will always be mystery inside the kingdom of God, which is the matrix. But now through science, the Bible's making more sense and we're understanding how to live out. We know what the Bible tells us to do. The Bible says have faith in God. But now science is telling us how to do it. And we That's do it funny. by, Paul said it, the word of faith, which is in your mouth. One way you do it is by the way you speak. Faith is in your mouth. Faith is in the way you think. So the, the, the miracles that Jesus did, just as he said, we're coming into a, an age and era now where we can do that too. Understanding how he did the miracles does not diminish it in any way. It doesn't diminish the role of Jesus or the place of miracles, but what it does is it helps us understand that as he is, so are we in this world. We have the same capacity, and now we're being gifted by the Spirit through science with the tools of knowing how to live it out. Now it galls the religious person that God would have the audacity to speak from a laboratory instead of a pulpit. Some people can't handle that, but the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. So if he wants to speak from a laboratory or a test tube or some scientific uh, protocol that they use, he can do that just as easily as he can through homiletics and hermeneutics and all that kind of stuff. So it, it's really exciting to see. And you were talking about, here, here's one. You are talking about, you know, the, the goal we had to be with him, to, to, to have more. I, I like, and I write about this in, in here. Uh, here's a, here's a, the kind of thing that science thrills me with. All right. So we know that everything at its fundamental essence is just energy. Everything is energy. The, the things that you can see, I'm holding my cell phone. The reason I can see that cell phone in my hand is because that matrix is, is vibrating, is oscillating, it's back and forth, back and forth at a high, high speed. Inner, physical things like this phone are things that have slowed down enough. The energy vibration has slowed down enough for you to see it. If you were to take an electron microscope and zoom in on this phone or this mouse or this book or even your own body, if you zoom in, you'll get down to the molecules and then the atoms right. and the subatomic particles. And if you keep zooming in, you're going to reach a place where you see particles popping in and out of visibility. It's energy. Wow. Wow. We as human beings, listen to this. We are right now are popping in and out of visibility 
20,000 times a nanosecond. (laughs) 20,000 times every thousandth of a second, you're popping in and out of visibility. So can I say it like this? Yeah. We're only living here part time. (laughs) <laughs> well, where yeah. am I when I'm not here? If I'm popping in and right. out of visibility in this world 20,000 <laughs> times a net, nanosecond, where am I when I'm not here? I'll tell you where, by the right hand of the Father. Yeah. So might we adequately and accurately say then that we're in two places at one time? I like it. I like it. <laughs> we're here Steve, or we're there. Steve, I'm just reminded of uh, something, you, you know, when you talk about religion, religion really just – demands that you do something to get to your God and uh, the, the unique aspect of Jesus and Christianity is that our God did something to get to us. Uh, you know, the incarnation becomes that just amazing thing that God would become his creation. But one thing that you're, you're bringing to light here is with these multiple outcomes or all possible outcomes is that then what our, what our connection with heaven is, is to be able to co-create with God, co-create our own futures, co-create the direction for our lives with God. I think Thomas J. Ord talks about this, but I think something that makes it really practical for me, and you mentioned it earlier on, is that you had this encounter with Grace in 1990, and then you mentioned that you came across Baxter Kruger. One thing that I'm finding, and this is a mystical, magical expression of it for me, but now you're bringing scientific terms to it, is that when you start having these paradigms and you start thinking about God in a different way, a better way, a more loving way, um, it inevitably it, it tends to disconnect you from the tribe that you are currently associated with. But in some way, it almost like magnetically draws you to other voices that are saying the same thing. It's like that resonance with Baxter Kruger and I found this in my own life. I found this in lives of many others that I've talked to. It's like I started thinking this way and, you know, I mean, kind of thought I was a heretic or something. But then, oh, it drew me to this other voice that thinks that way. It drew me to this. Do you think that applies to the quantum mechanics that you're talking you about? Know, you know, you know, in the quantum world, that's actually called quantum resonance. Because okay. I okay. cast off a certain energy. I cast off a certain signal. I mean, again, somebody, I'm telling you, somebody that's watching this right now is going to say, well, that sounds new agey to me. Listen, new age people use air conditioning too, but I'm not going to turn mine off. Just because (laughs) they understand something doesn't make it wrong. There are machines right now. There is equipment that they can point at a person that will be able to detect and take a picture of their energetic their energy signature is called. So we're all casting off. Our, we are, in fact, at the end of this book, I write about let your light so shine. We are literally emitting light, all of us at any time. So back to the quantum resonance, think of it like this. I cast off a certain perspective, a certain belief, a certain expectation, a certain worldview. It's going to resonate with others who share that. And I'll give an example. And I wrote about it in the book. If I'm sitting here with an acoustic guitar right now, five string guitar in my lap, and you're sitting just, let's say, four feet across the room, three feet right across the room in another chair from me. If I pluck the D string on my acoustic guitar, will it have any effect on your guitar? Yes, it will. What will happen? The D string on your guitar will resonate with the D string on mine. And without you having even plucked that string, you will hear your guitar making a sound. And it won't be one of the other strings. It'll be the D string because it's tuned in frequency with my, if it is, in fact, tuned in frequency with my guitar. So when I go through life, I'm going to say projecting, strumming a quantum note, it's going to resonate with other people who are on that same frequency with me. Yeah. Yeah, really real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't mean to cut you off, but real quick. So then then my thought process in when Paul said the entire mystery of the gospel is Christ in you, the hope of glory, could it be that at the depth of every person embedded 
is Christ resonating and ultimately everything will be reconciled in the res that, that, uh, <laughs> that reson resonating with, uh, with, with Christ. I mean, now it's like we're eternal. It. Now we're getting to it here. Here we Dude, go. I'm I like, I am I like, love. okay, I think that's it. Um, yeah. yeah. Well, could you, can you speak to that? Well, I love the fact that the apostle Paul in giving his own testimony talked about the time when God was pleased to reveal Christ in him. Yeah. Uh, not Christ to him, but Christ in him. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. I tell people all the time now, I, I, yeah, I, I come to think of it. I'm not sure where you guys are on this. People get frustrated with me sometime when I say this part, but hear me out. This is just where I am. And unlike yeah. I'll, I, I teach a live group, gracewalkexperience.com. If people are interested, I teach a live group every day and I tell people all the time, this ain't church and I'm not your pastor. You don't have to agree with me. You might have to agree with your pastor, but you don't have to agree with me. Uh, I've been wrong a lot of times and I probably am wrong about a lot of things still. If I knew what they were, I changed my mind. But the bottom line is I often say this, that I, uh, I am not a biblical universalist. And the reason for that is because my own perspective, my own understanding, there's just too much dialectical tension in scripture. But listen to this. You might call me a quantum universalist because yeah. I'm telling you the things the Bible has not been has not been able to make clear to me. Quantum science is making more and more clear to me. Yeah. Yeah. And what I don't believe. Let, let me say it like this, Derek. I don't think that ultimately everything and everybody will be reconciled to God. I don't believe in ultimate reconciliation. I believe in historic reconciliation. I believe everything and everybody has already been reconciled to God <laughs> and they just don't know it. I yeah, think yeah. that conversion is a recognition of what's already yeah. true of you. That's good. Not yeah, something that's no. going to happen at a future date, but something that's already real. That's yeah, and good. To say, back to your point of Christ in us. Can I, can I be brash enough to ask you if I can read an excerpt from my book to you? Yeah, please. Oh, okay. please this, do. This, Okay, this this is in the book. This is at, at very toward the end of the book. And the subsection is in chapter six is called Sing Your Song. L listen to this. I love I love this scientific fact. The, well, let me pull it over here on this other screen so I can see it easier. Hold on a minute. Um, and just so, you know, Steve, just so you know, Steve, Jason and I are not those that uh, worship our Bibles as the fourth member of the Trinity. Well, let's just let's just go ahead and lay that lay that out there. So go ahead. Well, then this is the epistle according to Steve. OK, so <laughs> what you will. the world around us is a symphony of wonders filled with breathtaking beauty. One of life's marvels that defines the essence of our being is our DNA, your genetic makeup defines the unique and intricate composition you truly have been created to be. Your life is an extraordinary melody written by the one who gave you, who gave voice to all creation. When the apostle Paul spoke to the idol worshiping pagans on Mars Hill, he directed their attention to their deepest identity saying, for in him, we live and move and exist. Even as some of your own poets have said, for we're also his offspring. Now, remember, he's talking to pagans. The word offspring in this statement is the Greek word genos, from which we get the word genealogy. If you think your ancestry began to, with Adam, you need to look back further. The Bible says your roots can be traced to your creator. We all share the DNA of God. While that references it to our physical makeup, it does suggest a beauty that's often obscured by religious blinders that cause people to believe they lack intrinsic beauty. All right, this, this, this was thrilling to me. In recent years, here's the science. The amazing connection between DNA and music has inspired musicians and researchers to explore this relationship, unlocking new perspectives on the human experience. What they have done is translate people's DNA sequences into music, and it has led to exceptional outcomes. As it turns out, we all have our own unique melody residing at the core of our DNA. So it's just cool. a matter of knowing how to play it. At their essence, both DNA and music are based on sequences and patterns. DNA carries the blueprint of life in the form of a sequence of nucleotide bases. 
adenine, cysticine, uh, guanine, and thymine, while music is an arrangement of pitches, rhythms, dynamics, and timbres. Numerous researchers have made this comparison over the year and is sometimes used to illustrate the beauty inherent to biology and music. Imagine for a moment the shocking notion that everybody's DNA can be seen as a unique musical piece. Each person carries within them a melody that is entirely their own, a wonderful composition that expresses the core of their being. Researchers have pursued this idea and they have mapped people's genetic, genetic codes onto musical elements and created musical outcomes that have been amazing. They converted DNA sequences into music by assigning specific musical notes to each DNA building block. For example, they might assign a C note to the DNA building block called adenine or an F note to thymine. As the DNA sequence is played like a musical score, it creates a unique melody that reflects the arrangement of DNA basis in our genes. The melodies created from DNA remind us of the breathtaking beauty and inspired uniqueness that inspire, inspires, uh, that defines each of us. Hang on, I'm mm -hmm. almost there. The potential okay. impact of this convergence of science and art ex excites the imagination. Picture a world where we can listen to the melodies of our ancestors, where we can trace our heredity through a symphony of genetic songs, wow. and where we can share our unique songs with each other. Some scientists describe that world as one that would bring us closer together since nothing quite connects people like music. Stop for a moment and consider you are a, this is everybody, are a beautiful musical masterpiece composed by a loving God. On the day you were born, he decided to sing himself into this world through you. You are a partaker of the divine nature. So it's not a stretch to suggest that the God who made all things wants to sing his life and love to the world through the unique and beautiful song that is your life. Christ shares himself in your sphere of influence. You are a miraculous melody of perfect pitch. One more paragraph. Every person has a unique song embedded in their DNA. When we each live from our authentic identity, we come together in human harmony. That's nothing less than spectacular. Your life is a symphony of experiences that can inspire and uplift those around you. Each note and chord represents a particular moment in time. And when strung together, they create a beautiful melody that is uniquely yours. So don't be afraid to sing aloud. Embrace life's joy and share your beautiful song with the world. Remember, you have a unique voice that can bring light and love to others. And there's nothing more beautiful than that. So sing and do it without inhibition. Isn't that a mar um, an amazing scientific thing? Love That's it. Incredible. Love it. I'm emotional. Have a, uh, anybody else emotional by science? Anybody else? Listen, want to That's funny you say that, Jason, because uh, early on when I started studying quantum science, I, I, there'd be times I would wipe tears out of my eyes. My wife yeah. said, what are you reading? I'd say physics. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, have you lost your mind but it's like it's beautiful it's it's it a, it's another preacher come to town called science yeah. who's yeah. teaching us yeah, about it, the it's goodness more, it's more beautiful than we could possibly yes. even imagine i, I just it is. it is a better the, gospel and it keeps getting better wow that's I, it yeah that's i'm overwhelmed it. jason better it's better. the it's the expansive nature of his goodness. It's it's the idea that we talk about the podcast. The idea is, is that we're going to rethink his we're going to rethink God because he's better than the last thought we had about him, <laughs> and and it's just uh, continues. He just continues to be better and more. Uh, yeah. his, his goodness is measureless. I use this term sovereign love because I haven't known what to. Uh, I've been fascinated. I realized for the last fifteen years since that cataclysmic moment. Uh, about the sovereignty of God. And I feel like uh, in the last couple of years, I feel like he's been telling me, I'm, Jason, I'm going to, I'm continuing to redefine how you understand sovereignty. Of course, it doesn't, doesn't work in the context of control or authoritarianism. Uh, it is a sovereignty based in what we're, you're talking about right now, the consent of love, this love that surpasses uh, time and space that is before and after and is, is, has created a beautiful melody in me and in you and in the person that's listening. And, and, uh, 
the idea that this love is is a, a unifying revelation. Man, I can't tell you how excited I am about what you said because uh, I think I, I would like you to say the phrase again. I think I'm that kind of universalist. Um, not a biblical I, universalist, I, I, a historical a reconciliationist. Was that it? Well, let, let me tell you why I say that, Jason. I, I I coined this phrase. I, I've never read it. I made it up. It maybe sounds silly to somebody, but I call myself a quantum universalist. Quantum. Uh, I like it. There's dialectical tension in the Bible that you know. That there's space for argument, but when you look at when you look at the quantum world, here's here's the thing. I believe there is this divine frequency which is Christ filling the cosmos. Yes. And yeah. that voice, that note that eternal never ending note of yes. God's love resonating through all things yeah. for eternity. Remember what I said, resonance is when frequency. There it is. You know, and I believe if that note, if I, if the D, if the L string of love, so to speak is plucked for eternity, it just things there, there's a thing. I'll give you the science, another science thing. Here's, here's the kind of amazing thing. You can look this up. You guys that are watching this, look it up for yourself. Don't take my word for it. So a guy goes into a grandfather, into a clock shop. They've done this many times. And there are all these grandfather clocks in there. And he just goes down the line and he starts making the pendulums and all the grandfather clocks swing, right? All right. So they're all swinging. All these dozens of grandfather clocks are all swinging. He's getting them all back and forth, the pendulum. Did you know that you can leave those clocks alone? And if you come back, it, it, no, no definite set time that it works every time the same way. But over time, if you come back, did you know that all those pendulums will be swinging in sync together? That's Look amazing. it up. I'm not making this stuff up. Wow. Look it up. All the yeah. pendulums will be moving in sync together. Why? Because of resonance, because the, the energy that they give off comes into a synchronicity together. And they begin to move together. Now, if a grandfather clock will do that in a clock shop, you tell me that the frequency of divine love won't one day get all the clocks swinging in the right direction at the same Come time. On. I just find it hard to believe otherwise. Yeah, I think he's that good. I, I am with you on it. I love it. I I could talk about this for another hour, but <laughs> we, we've had you. <laughs> we've had, I, I believe it, and I uh, I'm thankful for you, and thankful for uh, our opportunity to connect. And and um, uh, we have had you an hour, and um, I want to honor that. Um, can we talk tacos for a second? Because that's one thing where we can find resonance. I I feel like <laughs> Derek and I have this theory that all all people come into agreement that all cultures have their own taco. So, yeah. like the grandfather clock, we all come into this agreement that we must keep our priorities aligned and not overlook anything. <laughs> right? Right. Yeah. So, that's Steve. Right. So, uh, what we need you to do? Would... What we need you to do is in um, like salivating detail. We need to hear your <laughs> one of your best taco experiences. Florida taco or whatever it is. Well, my best taco experience, and, and I've had it multiple times, is a place called uh, Santo Coyote. Okay. And it's, it's a wonderful restaurant in Guadalajara, Mexico. I told you that Grace Walk has offices in six different countries, and Mexico is one of those countries. And Gerardo Vasquez is our Latin director if, if, uh, for, for uh, Grace Walk. And when I go there, especially for any special occasion, birthdays, anniversaries, we always make sure we go to Santo Coyote because, let me tell you, you've not had a real taco until you eat a taco <laughs> in Mexico. That's right. They, you know, they make the guacamole right there at your table. They bring the bowl out and all there the ingredients. Go. You watch them cook the beef right there in front of you. So you've got the pico de gallo and that, oh, I'm going to call it homemade, freshly made guacamole. They, 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 they cook, it's soft tacos there. So they do the tortilla on that hot griddle and you watch them yep. take that right off the griddle, put that meat on there, that fresh guacamole <laughs> and that tomato and lettuce and the cheese. Oh, I, I'm, I'm going to have to go up here and buy a ticket to Mexico. Having talked about it. <laughs> hey, I'm salivating. That was it. You that, nailed that, it. That was <laughs> a whole vibe. That was an entire vibe that we just heard. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Awesome. Santo Coyote in Guadalajara, Guadalajara, Mexico. Anybody watching this that ever goes to Guadalajara, you got 
got to go there, especially when they have their uh, Sunday brunch and uh, Come on. participate. <laughs> All right. That's, that's on my, that's on the bucket list now. That's it. I love it. <laughs> Uh, uh, Steve, uh, share with, um, folks where they can find uh, you and the book and maybe a little bit about what you're doing, what's burning in you right now. Thank you. Uh, the only place the book is available right now is on Amazon. So it's available as an ebook, obviously a print book. Uh, we're working toward, uh, having it as an audible book. Hopefully in the next month, it'll be an audible book. I'm not going to promise that, but that's the goal. I will say that it, in the next few weeks, in the month of June, uh, it will be available uh, in Spanish. The book will be on awesome. Amazon in Spanish. So you can Very get cool. the book on Amazon. In terms of what I'm doing, uh, I have a daily group. It's on a platform called Thinkific. So for those who do not want to uh, go on Facebook, and I've had people say, when you leave Facebook, I'll be interested. We're not, we don't have our group on Facebook anymore. It's on another platform. You can go to uh, gracewalkexperience.com. It is a subscription group. It's a paid group. I put stuff, you know, on YouTube and Facebook every week, uh, make a lot of stuff available publicly, but this is a deep, a group that goes deeper and it's a daily thing, but you can go to gracewalkexperience.com and find out information about that. I am already a well underway with follow-up books for this. Uh, in July, I have another book coming out called Quantum Faith. Okay. So this is the starter, Quantum yeah. Life. In July, I will have another book coming out called Quantum Faith, and probably later in the year, a book called Quantum Prayer. So so if, if those of you that will track with me, if you're on Facebook, you can find me at Dr. Steve McVeigh um, and uh, track with me there. I'm on YouTube go to Grace Walk Experience and you can keep up with what I'm doing with the books that I have coming out. But Man. Thanks for asking. Thank you. Uh, grateful for this time. Grateful for uh, the Grace Walk that you have lived, man. I, I'm Beyond an Angry God was, um, was when I was first introduced to you. That's actually when we had you on a few years ago. Um, and it was, it resonated and, and uh, boy, these, uh, this journey and uh, these books that you're writing, man, I'm grateful for you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you, Steve. I, I think your uh, your voice is going to be really, really helpful to uh, our audience. And uh, obviously, I, I just want to resonate with that song that's coming out of you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I feel like stuck there. So thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. My pleasure being with you guys today. Hey, guys. So glad you joined us on Rethinking God with Tacos. You can find me, Jason Clark, online at afamilystory.org, where I encourage you to sign up on our mailing list. We send out an email twice a month letting you know about new podcasts, articles, and new books or products that we have coming out. Plus, occasionally, I'll keep you up on my schedule where I'm traveling. My Twitter handle is at Jason Clark is. I'm on Instagram under the same handle, and you can find me on Facebook as well. Yeah, and my name is Derek Turner, Jason and I love that you're listening to us. Thank you for all your feedback. Please write in, let us know what's going on in your life. But uh, we are pursuing a mission to help people rethink God. And we thank you for being a part of it. Uh, you can find me at Pastor Derek T on all the socials. And then, of course, I pastor a church here in Charlotte, North Carolina called River Church, rivercharlotte.com. Come and join us. We'd love to have you. Hey, all of these podcasts are available on all the platforms, iTunes, Spotify, Google. Yeah. Hey, make sure and like, share, and throw a review out there. Let people know. We love good reviews on the podcast. It helps people find us. That's right. So if this is a podcast that you enjoy, <laughs> then please Promote it, share it, give it a good five-star rating. I like that. That's a good idea. Hey, love doing this journey with you. Praying grace and wonder over you today.